Hi there. In this tutorial, I'm going to demonstrate some techniques on how to create an effect somewhat like this. So you can see I've got a number of different cogs or gears. They're all moving independently and you can see they're all in a big sort of collection. Uh, it's a misty background. We've got some lights in the background and you can see that the camera is moving around in various ways. And you can see we've even got some mist in the scene as well. So to begin with, let's add some cogs. First of all, make sure under preferences, make sure that you've got the add mesh extra objects add on selected. If you haven't just select it there and that will then make your life a little easier. Now you can just model from scratch your cogs if you wish to, or whatever other shapes that you want. But if you want to create cogs like that, the easiest way is to use this add on. And then when we add a mesh, one of the option here is gears. So if we select gear, there is our basic gear and underneath my little helper here you can see that we've got some things we can change. So obviously this is the number of teeth, then the overall radius, the depth or width they call it of the gear, how far the base goes in and out like that, and then these didendum and addendum affects things like the depth of the teeth and how pointy the teeth are, and then you've got these, this thing called pressure angle which affects the tip, and you can even skew the gear like that and add a few other interesting effects. And if you do crown, it sort of brings it up that way. So it's up to you how much detail you put into it. It doesn't fill the center of the cog in, so it's worth selecting those two middle loops, right click, and if you've got loop tools enabled, which is another add-on, you can then just say bridge and it will connect the two together like that. So I'm just gonna make three gears, but you can see it's quite quick to do. So we'll just move that one over there. We'll add another gear. We'll just go for a few teeth this time. Zero on the pressure angle, zero on skewness, zero on conical angle, and zero on crown. And again, we'll just bridge that to make that a little smaller. And again, bridge the inside there. And I could even Scale Shift Z and bring that in afterward if I want to. And if you want to, you can play around with some other things. That's one of the things that I did. You can create part of the cog and then mirror it to save you a bit of effort, but it doesn't really take that long just to go around and select a few vertices like this. And then Scale Shift Z and we can get an interesting shape on our cog like that. So there's three cogs. We obviously need to give them a material, so we'll just give them a basic material at the moment. We'll leave that one as a sort of basically white colour. In fact, we'll go slightly blue, which is the sort of colour you would go to for steel. But we'll increase metallic and we'll add some anisotropic, which essentially means a sort of polished metal effect. So you have very fine grain on the surface, which will help to pick up reflections without it being a mirror reflection. And we'll turn roughness down a fair bit. So we'll call this steel go to this cog we'll select the steel click here to make it a different material we'll call this one brass essentially that's going to be about the same except it'll have a yellow sort of gold kind of color to it and then we'll select this one we'll give this the brass color click here and we'll make this one more like copper so much more red pinky red in color but everything else will leave the same so we're going to move these, looking down on the scene, just over to here. And with all three selected, shift M and we'll say, move those to a new collection, which we've called currently collection, but we'll call this gears. Now, so that's created a new collection with these three objects in. So I'm only going to render this over 500 frames. So there's our end frame of 500 there. So I'm going to select this object. I'm going to press I and I'm going to store the rotation and I'm going to do the same for this one and the same for this one but I haven't actually recorded any change in rotation I've just created a keyframe storing the rotation because what I want to do is create some 
as it were, automatic movement of these cogs without actually having to keyframe that movement. Obviously, if it was just rotation, that's pretty easy to do. And in fact, with this one, I think that is what I'll do. So I'm at the beginning. I'm going to go to the end. I'm going to rotate on the Z 720 and press I and record the rotation again. Now that would have defaulted to a Bezier interpolation. So it will be slow at first, it will speed up and then it will slow down again. And very often that is what we want. But in this case, I actually want it to be completely linear. So I've pulled down a new window. Obviously you can use these options up here. I tend to prefer my own. And we'll go to the graph editor. And you can see there's this Bezier curve there. So I'll go to key, interpolation mode, linear. And now it's just a straight line. So you can see there it goes. It's just simply rotating throughout. And if we look here, we can see that blue, which is Z, is the axis that's rotating. If I click this little arrow here, or you can press N and go to modifiers, we can add a modifier to that, which is what we're going to do. And we'll go for built in function. Now at the moment, if I press play, you can see it's just swinging backwards and forwards. If I set the amplitude to zero, you'll notice we've lost our rotation. But if I click additive like that, you can now see we've got our rotation back. So now if I turn the amplitude up slightly, what it's doing is adding that sine wave on top of the overall rotation. So I'm going to turn that phase down. We'll try 0.5. And you can now see it will go up and back a little bit, up and back a little bit, and so on, which is a bit like the motion of a cog, I would say. So that was how I created some of the motion for them. And then for this one, We've just got a single keyframe, but there's no movement attached to it at the moment. So under modifiers, we'll use the built in function again. We'll turn the phase modifier down to 0.25 and we'll turn the amplitude down to 0.1, perhaps 0.25. And you can see we've got a cog just swinging backwards and forwards. And then for this one, let's go to the let's stop the animation a moment. Let's go to the end. We'll rotate Z360 and store that rotation. So again, that will be a Bezier curve to start with. So it's slow at first and then speeds up. But what I'll do this time, rather than a simple Bezier curve under key interpolation mode, we can try one of these others. So let's look at bounce and see what that looks like. So you can see it was slow at first, it's speeding up. And you can see as we get up to the top here, we get some interesting motion. So it's a bit slow. And of course, we can add a built in function on top of that if we wish. Just make sure that if you want it to stay in that axis, that you're adding that built in function to the correct axis. So in this case, Z. So we'll reduce that phase modifier and the amplitude as well. That's quite interesting. We've got some very interesting effects there. I set that to tangent just to give another different option. So it goes very, very fast and then slows down again. So we've got three gears that no matter how long this animation, as long as that last keyframe is at the end for those that use more than one keyframe, they will be just nicely animated and they're all in a collection. So the next step is to create a particle instance for them all. So I'm just going to create a cube, go to particles, say new particle settings, leave it on emitter, but under frame start and end, set them both to one. So basically all the particles are created immediately and make sure the lifetime is longer than the lifetime of your animation. Then come down to velocity. There'll be a default in there. We want to set that to zero. Everything else should already be on zero. Click rotation, open that up and make sure dynamic is selected. So this allows particles to move around if we want them to. I set randomized to maximum. I set phase to maximum and I set randomized phase to maximum, which for all intents and purposes is more about the starting point. Under angular velocity, I set that to 0.9 and random. So that just gives them a random rotation and dynamic rotation. It will, they'll continue to rotate over time and it sets that in a random direction. But under render, and instead of halo, set that to collection and select the gears collection. If I go to wireframe, and increase the scale. And I had a starting scale of about one. 
and a randomness of 0.9. Normally I would disable show emitter and then the box itself will disappear when we render, but I'm actually going to use it for something else later on. So I'm going to leave that enabled for the moment. Select object rotation and pick random. Then under field weights, just turn gravity all the way to zero. So I just noticed a slight error I made when I created this cube, I actually put it inside the gears collection. It's because I still had that collection selected. Obviously you can't instantiate an object inside itself. So to fix that, I just grab that and just drop it up here to the main collection. And now you can see I've got a cloud of gears appearing in there. But you'll notice they're all appearing on the surface at the moment, which might be interesting, but that's not what we're looking for. So under the particle settings, under source, set this to volume. I also set it to random and I turned off even distribution. So now you can see we've got cogs appearing all over the place. And what I've just done is turned off show emitter in the viewport display so that this box doesn't show up when I go to rendered mode. And I should have said at the beginning that I decided to do this in EV mode to try to have a somewhat faster render. So we'll come up here and we'll change this to EV. We'll drop the render to 32 and the viewport to 10. And if we go to rendered view, obviously there are no lights in the scene at the moment, so it looks a bit lackluster. So I'm just going to add a light, which is a point light. And we'll put that there. We go to our light settings. We'll stick with that color, basically a, a white color but I put that up to a lot brighter. So I went up to 500 watts on that one. And then I'll just shift D and put some others basically next to each face of the cube. I'll come out of rendered view to make it a bit quicker and rotate Z90. And now I've got currently a white light next to each face. And now what I'll do is I'll just change the color of some of those lights just to make it a bit more interesting in terms of the reflection. And I've left a couple of them as white. So if we have a look at that, so right now, the cube is blocking all of the light. You can see if I bring a light source inside, it starts to illuminate things, but not out there. So I need to do something about the material on that cube now. So we'll go to the shader editor and we'll give the cube a basic material. But I don't need the principal shader. What I will do is add shader, which is a principled volume shader and connect that to volume. If you accidentally connect that to surface, it's not gonna work. Set the density to 0.01 is very low and I set the anisotropy up to 0.85. So that just gives you a variation in the way that the light works depending on where it is relative to the camera. And I'm now going to set the background to black. So at this point I'm just going to turn off this little widget here to switch off overlays and then I'm going to select show emitter under the viewport and you can now start to see the effect that we're going to get with those lights shining onto the side of the cube. So we're seeing most of our gears in silhouette. And that might be the effect you want with just the occasional little reflection here and there. If I press play, you can see we're getting little glittery effects. And that's quite good in itself. If I make sure I've got the cube selected, we can play around with things like the anisotropy. So that we, if you see if I turn that all the way down to here, we get a bright spot. If I start to turn that up, we'll get some interesting effects, perhaps somewhere like that. And just a little side note, if I now go to the settings in here, let's turn on screen space reflections, which will mean these objects will start to show reflections of the objects around them rather than just reflecting the lights. And I turned off half res trace, so that sort of increases the quality. It will slow the rendering down a little bit. I turned the trace precision right up and I left the rest at default. I also switched on bloom, but I turned the radius down a little bit because I felt it was a bit too strong and the intensity down to about 0.25. And you can see we're starting to get some interesting effects. And then under volumetrics, I set the tile size to two, which is much higher resolution. And now you can see we're starting to get the God ray effects. And I set the samples up to 128. Again, this is slowing it down a little bit, but you can see we're getting a higher quality render now. And I turned on volumetric shadows. Now you can really see them and you can certainly see it's slowing it down. I'm going to stop the animation at that point. Let's let it go for a little bit so we can see more of these shadows. And then I turned the shadow samples up to 32. 
you have to experiment with obviously the render time versus the quality of what you're trying to achieve. So I quite like that, whether you're going to use that as a still scene. However, what I also wanted to do was to sort of illuminate the cogs a little bit. So for that, I selected my camera. I need to turn on overlays to be able to see it properly. And I added a light, which is a spotlight. I'll just bring that out to here. Scale it down a bit just so that I can see what I'm doing. Rotate X 90. Roughly line it up with the camera. Doesn't really matter whether it's in front or behind. And then select the camera as well with Shift. Control P and set object to parent. And now when the camera moves around, that lamp will move around as well. And for the lamp settings, I used 100 watts. Roughly white light. I set the size of the spot to 80 degrees and the blend to one. So that makes it a sort of softer blend as it goes to the outside of the cone. And now we go to rendered view and with my camera selected, I'll move in and you can see the camera is now, it's even illuminating the mist. That may or may not be what you want. So if I select my cube again, I can play around with the anisotropy and get different effects. You can see I've gone into a positive number there and I'm not getting the reflection of the lamp in the camera. And I had an anisotropy of about 0 0.8, 0 0.85, something like that. And we'll turn the color all the way up to white. And that will brighten the light up a bit as well. So what I also did was have the light a certain distance in front of the camera. And you can play around with the radius to illuminate more of what's in front of the camera. You can, of course, put it slightly to one side of the camera if you want to, to avoid little reflections like this. But I didn't find that to be too much of a problem. So that's it for the setup of the scene. And now just a few little bits about how I moved the camera around. So here's my camera. And for one of them, I simply placed the camera in one corner, recorded the position with the eye and keyframe location, went to the end of the animation, moved the camera to the opposite corner, and again recorded that. When I just play the animation, obviously that just moved the camera through. One of the other things I did was actually to take a copy of one of these cogs, put it in the middle. At this point, I'll just hide the overall cog, place the camera in a position where it was looking at that cog, something like that. I'll move both of them over to here somewhere. So having done that, I then just rotated that cog I used a cog that was obviously rotating and had the camera just parented to that. So just control P object, keep transform and then press P. And obviously the cog appears to stay stationary in the scene. Well, everything else seems to move around. So you can see everything else is now moving around. I didn't use a cog that was wobbling like that because I thought it would make you a bit ill looking at it. And then finally, I'll just select the camera and clear the parent. So now when I press play, the camera is not following it. Make a note of the name of that cog. So in this case, it's gear 003. Add a constraint, which is a damped track. Select gear 003 in this case. I had to set it to minus Z to get it to look at that gear. And now no matter what I do with the position of the camera, it always points at the cog. So once again, I then through the animation, placed the camera in a position at the beginning of the animation selected location, went to the end of the animation, moved the camera somewhere else, and again, pressed location. I'll go to graph editor again, just to change key interpolation mode to linear so that we haven't got that Bezier form of movement. And now you can see as the camera moves, it continues to point at that cog. And if I look through here, you can see that the cog's angle appears to change because the camera is moving past it, but it's always in the field of view. And if we bring everything else back, you can see we're moving through things. And that's really all there is to it. So I hope you found that interesting. If you did, let me know, and I'll see you in the next tutorial. Thanks a lot.
So I hope you found that interesting. If you did, let me know. If you enjoy these tutorials, don't forget to click like and subscribe. I also have a Facebook page and a Twitter account, and I now have a Patreon page as well. And I'll provide links to all of those in the description below. So I'll see you in the next tutorial. Thanks a lot.